You know, I, just as an opening comment, uh, I've always thought there are two kinds of tired uh, being pooped. Uh, one is where you're mentally and physically just worn out, you know, and been a bad day, nothing has gone right, and you say, I'm glad it's over. And the other is a good poop, where uh, you're tired, but you feel achievement, you feel good about what you did. And right now, that would sort of describe me. I've been going since 7.45 this morning, and I don't mind telling you, if I sit down when I get home, I may not get up for a while. <laughs> but what a great uh, tired, my goodness. Uh, as I uh, told the colonel outside, uh, I should have to pay to get in. You know, it's been so enlightening, and thank you for inviting me into your work centers and, and allowing me to share with you some of my reflections and comments. I'm, I am very honored by that. Uh, I have learned over the years when I don't quite know what to say, I just say, wow, wow, <laughs> and that gets me off the hook. And I've spent a lot of time today just saying, wow. When I get briefed, and I go, wow. And my only hope is that you don't test me and say, we can't let you go, Gaylor, until you pass a test, because I'm not sure I could remember everything uh, that I've learned. But I'm a lot smarter than I was at 7.30 this morning. So thank you for all you do, and thank you for inviting me into your work centers, and I'm glad to be with you. That's uh, one side of my coin, like uh, so many. I have a coin, and that's one side of it, uh, of course. Bob Gaylor, CMSA of five, 1977-79. Uh, the odds are pretty good that uh, no one in the audience came in during that time. There was a time when I would go to the Senior Academy at Gunner, and um, two-thirds of the audience, be those that entered during that time frame. But now uh, we're up to the mid to late 80s, joined in 86, 87, 88, 89. So the Air Force has somewhat uh, gone past me. Number 18 is in the job now. I guess uh, put Cody's picture up there. I was at the ceremony. Uh, Jim retired and is now working for Lockheed in Orlando, those of you that knew Cody. And the new guy, Chief Wright, has now uh, uh, taken over, and he'll do well. He's a, he's a bright thinker, and uh, the time I spent with him, I was very much impressed. The position is 50 years old, 1 April. And on the 18th of April, or 19th of April, uh, we're all going to assemble at Gunner. There's about 12 of us living, and, or 11 of us maybe. And we're all going to be together for a grand celebration, a formal uh, mess dress event on that Friday night of that week. So I'll be driving down there to be a part of that. Um, you're looking at a guy who's very proud, very blessed. You're also looking at a guy whose feet are flat on the ground. I'm not floating around in outer space. I'm still Bob Gaylor from Mulberry, Indiana. I know where my roots are. I've never forgotten. Uh, when I was a two-stripe airman and they renamed the base I was at, I got to open the door for the Secretary of the Air Force, Stuart Symington. And that was my only task, just to open his door. I remember how I felt. I called my mom, said, you will not believe I've been picked to open the door for the Secretary. I've never forgotten that. Uh, so when an airman said, excuse me, would you sign, would you pose for a picture? I would never, ever say no, absolutely, because I remember how I felt. And I would say to you, don't ever forget where it all started. Don't ever forget where you came from, and don't ever become so pompous that you lose sight of the fact that human interaction is still what it's all about. I put together this talk, uh, my years with the United States Air Force, September 1948, 18-year-old kid from Mulberry, Indiana. Uh, and that bottom, but wait, there's more. That's a takeoff on infomercials, <laughs> don't, don't they? But wait, there's more. If you order now, we'll send you two. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a uh, uh, 
whatever, and a Japanese knife that cuts through uh, metal and all that stuff. So I don't know where it's going to end. I'll be 87 in uh, May. I had salivary gland cancer, and so that's why I salivate out of the corner of my mouth occasionally after. Uh, 33 radiation bouts will do that to you. Uh, no complaint. So I don't know. I'm not able to do as much. I was doing about 30 bases a year. Now if I do five or eight, uh, that'll be about enough. I told some of you uh, uh, on April 6th, I spoke at the uh, wing at Youngstown, Ohio, a reserve wing. I, I drove over there from Indiana uh, to speak at that, and it, and it felt good. The best medicine I take is an audience and a microphone. Uh, so, but wait, there's more. Um, press the button. That, um, what is the secret? That young lady, I married February the 8th, 1953. I was staff sergeant. You can see I was wearing my uh, white shirt and black bow tie. Uh, she passed away in 2012 of uh, leukemia. <clears throat> and, uh, but uh, Selma and I were married 59 years. So much of what I became, I owe to her. I never would have achieved without her guidance, support, affection, assist, and critique. She used to tell me when I screwed up. She would let me have it on the way home from an event you shouldn't have said or that. So she was so valuable in my life. The key to a 59-year marriage, uh, we took two vows when we married. Vow number one, two things we would never do in the bedroom, point and laugh. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, if you want to end a marriage, that's probably the best way to do it. Arr! Yeah. And the other vow we took to go dining and dancing one night a week. And she went Tuesdays, I went Fridays. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, the guy's funny. Uh, uh, you make a marriage last by trust and respect and friendship and love and affection and caring and there's a lot of answers, open communication. I look back and one thing I was good at and probably didn't even know it was communicating. You know, when we married, I said to her, honey, you need to know that in the Air Force, uh, they may send me to Kunsan, Korea, which sure enough they did. I think there should not be any secrets in a marriage. I think there should be a, it may never happen, but it could type. Uh, we may be asked to relocate. So I. I tried to keep my family involved. Another question I'm asked is, uh, how does the Air Force of today compare with my early years? What's the Air Force 2017 compared to 1949? That's when that picture was taken. I was a trained killer. Uh, you can see I'm wearing low quarter shoes. There were no boots. Uh, I wore an armband that said Air Police. There were no beret. I wore a white strap around my calf. There was no Taurus staff car. I drove that World War II Jeep. There was no fancy security forces building. That's the Provo Marshal's office. Behind, as you can see, a World War II building. Uh, so here I am now, 60 what, 68 years later. And you're supposed to ask, has the Air Force changed? <laughs> yeah. In what way? <laughs> and uh, so I've been, Asked that so many times, I put together a talk, and the talk focuses on the four T's. I'm going to answer the question, how's the Air Force changed with four T words? Now, you're supposed to be asking yourself, what are the four words? Can you feel the suspense? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so to expedite my answer, uh, I come up with four T words that have dramatically changed how the Air Force operates today. So here we go. T number one, uh, training. We train better. <clears throat> Starting at Lackland, uh, the MTIs, they do better. How do I know I'm an MTI? Four and a half years. Uh, 1957 to 62. I thought I was uh, Sierra Hotel. I thought I was really... <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I couldn't carry their swagger stick now. 
uh, the way they're trained and the way they operate and the way they present themselves and the way they march without bobbing their head, yeah, I hadn't gotten to that. So we train better. And you know what else? Uh, technical training. I went to MP school, Camp Gordon, Georgia. There was no air police school. Uh, uh, then there were only a few tech schools. Now everybody goes. <clears throat> and the training they received, I was down at Keesler at, uh, and I went to two schools, avionics and air traffic control. And their mock-ups were, wow, wow, realistic. And, and the trainees were engaged in the training. And I couldn't believe. Add to that about 70 airmen leadership schools, less than that now. There was at one time 70 now. One at every base. I spoke to the ALS here Tuesday at Medina Annex. <clears throat> what a great job. NCO Academies, there must be a dozen, including the best one, the Gaylor Academy <laughs> at uh, Lackland. Senior Academy at Gunner. Uh, chief courses. Well, I don't have to beat this to death. The Air Force of today is better trained. And at the Security Forces Building, I received briefings on some of the training that's going on at Fort Bliss. I didn't even know we had a unit out there. So better training. The next T, you know what it is. You know what it is. <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, technology. <clears throat> You've got a pocket full of gadgets. Yeah, some of you, I catch you looking down at your, whatever, at your Twitter. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, all kind. Listen, I, I don't want to beat this to death, but when you go to work, you spend the first 10 minutes just turning stuff on and getting it ready to do whatever it does. <clears throat> I uh, was a cop, and uh, I have been, what do you call that uh, imaging device where you sit in a car and detect movement? Thermal. Uh, yeah, raise your hand if you've heard of it. Thermal imaging device. And I say, wow. And I say, you remember how we used to do it? Anybody out there? <laughs> Now they have a thermal imaging device, and I go, wow. So technology has come on the scene. Like you, we used to read in comic books about space, Flash Gordon. Now it's a reality. Now you're concerned about drones and enemy drones. And oh, we only dreamt of that stuff. It was so far out. Now, before I give you the third T, I have a question. Let's pretend. Let's say that we have the latest technological gadgetry. There is not a device the Air Force does not own. We have got state-of-the-art everything, okay? And nobody knows how to operate or maintain it. <laughs> what good is the equipment? Let's say that our airmen are trained on every device known to technology, and we don't own any of it. What good is the training? Let's put the two together. A highly trained airman like you with the appropriate technology, you know what you've got now? Mission accomplishment. That's probably the best definition of mission accomplishment you'll ever hear. A combination of appropriate equipment with highly trained specialists operating that equipment and you get things done. That's why at the height of 1960, we had 865,000 airmen. Now you're sitting at about, what, 320, 316. How are you able to do the great job you do with the benefit of technology and better training? How am I doing so far? Pretty good, third T. I'm a clever guy. I wanted to stay with the four T's because it's sort of a gimmick. So I had to be creative. And the fourth T is uh, uh, tribe. Why did that go too? You didn't see that fourth T. Yeah. The, the third T is tribe. See, if I had said Tamley, you wouldn't know what the, I was talking about. <clears throat> 
Now this picture, I want to spend a moment with this picture. Uh, that's Selma, you met her earlier, that's my wife. That's my daughter Carol uh, standing there. She's now uh, 63 years old. Her son is a major at Barksdale in uh, Global Strike Command. She does my emails, I don't have a computer. I, you can see now I'm having trouble operating the equipment. But uh, she, that's my son Eddie on your left. He died of renal failure in 2000 at the age of 45. Parents aren't supposed to outlive their children. So it's very tragic. I hope it never happens to you. But it happened to me, and because of faith, family, friends, and resilience, I was able to go on uh, with our life. That's uh, my daughter, Elaine. She lives out in Del Webb Community in Alamo Ranch. Her husband's a retired master sergeant medic. They're a great family. And that young fellow in the middle is a retired lieutenant colonel that flew uh, C-141s out of Charleston and special ops plane out of Herbert and Eglin. Uh, my three kids live in the city and it's great. I am so blessed to have family. Uh, I'm a great family guy and we gather a couple times a week just to be together. That photo, by the way, is our passport photo going to Japan in 1962. <laughs> passport photos aren't meant to flatter you or make you look beautiful, but I just thought you could meet my family. Now, who's been to a, a parade lately, a graduation parade? How many uh, friends and family and parents were in the stands? Four to 6,000? <clears> that wasn't always. We used to brief the trainees, tell your mom to stay away. We don't want her here. It's time to cut the umbilical cord. As of now, I am your mother, your father, your brother. I am all you need. Now we say, invite mom. We give her a coin or something to commemorate. We finally got smart and realized the importance of family. Now we have daycare centers, family support centers. I I'm trying to answer the question, how has the Air Force changed? We're better trained. We got better technology and we take better care of our tribe, our family. The fourth T you accidentally saw, uh, the odds are you would not have been able to guess it, it's trust. You're better trusted. I entered an Air Force absent of trust. I always wanted to be a good airman and they kept me from being that by telling me, shut up, Gaylor, and quit asking stupid questions. Uh, just do what you're told, Gaylor, and we'll get along fine. But I, shut up, Gaylor, didn't you hear me the first time? Now, we're trusted. And the best example is that shield, those of you who wear that. When that first came out, we didn't get to keep it. We turned it in and out with our pistol, preparing for guard mount. It was stored in the armory along with our weapon. And so I asked my sergeant, why can't I keep my badge? Why can't I keep my shield? And he said, you know, Gaylor, you'd be trying to get in movies free. <laughs> you'd be trying to ride the city bus flashing your badge and quit asking stupid questions, Gaylor. I was a master sergeant in Tachiko with Japan the first time I ever got to keep my shield. And even then you could only wear it to duty. Now I go to the senior academy and there are people sitting out there with a shield on, some of you. Uh, when you're off duty, I see in the commissary shower, I didn't get to do that. Now, how come you get to do it? Because guys like me earned the trust. We proved that we would not be trying to get in movies free and that we would wear the badge with honor and uh, sophistication and we could be trusted. Tell me why now commandants of academies or chiefs, they used to be lieutenant colonels. Flight chiefs at leadership schools were captains and majors. Now they're masters and seniors. Procurement specialists used to be GS-15 civilians. Now they're senior airmen handling multi-million dollar contracts. How did that happen, guys like me? We earned that trust. It wasn't given to us. We earned it. And so you better not screw it up. 
If you think of screwing up, call me immediately and I'll talk you out of it. Don't call me after you screw up and say, but I was an abused child. I'll get the hell away from me. Don't give me that crap. <laughs> you got to continue to earn the trust that your dad and mom and your uncle and aunt and your brother and sister earned like I did. Okay, now back to the question. How does the Air Force today compare? Well, you decide. Is it better or isn't it? Seems to be. I like what I see. I like what I see in the general officer ranks, in the chief ranks, in the major rank. I like what I see in the airman ranks going through Lackland. I like what I see. I wouldn't travel. I wouldn't leave Alex Trebek in jeopardy if I didn't like to be out among the Air Force. Yeah, I'd be home watching uh, uh, Wheel of Fortune. I like what I see. So that should answer the question. Huh? How's the Air Force changed? Next slide, please. Oh, that's me. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> this is the point where I make a confession. Yeah, forgive me for I have sinned. I do not have a degree. You don't have a degree? I just said that. I do not have a degree. Why not? I was lazy. And you became Chief Mass Sergeant in the Air Force? Yeah, my pictures over there, yeah. <laughs> Without a degree? Yeah. I have a high school diploma in 1947. That should impress you. <laughs> Would you be able to be Chief Master of the Air Force today without a degree? No, but I did. Well, how did you get by? How did you perform? I had an abundance of common sense. <laughs> I am a common sense guru. I will flood you with common sense. If the president and his cabinet would just call me. I could resolve a lot of the issues in a 30 second phone call. Should we give billions of dollars to Iran? No. And, and, you know, and that would be the end of that. But no, they talk about it and they bounce it off walls and the talking heads go on TV. Uh, so I, I have an abundance of common sense. Uh, but some of you may not have enough. Yeah, you're probably technically brilliant and you know how to text and all that stuff. But when it comes to just gut feeling, conscience, doing the right thing, I think there's a shortage of it in America. So I think you and I need to promote common sense. So everything I'm going to say now in the rest of my briefing is common sense. And if you don't like that, now would be the best time to leave. So here we go. <laughs> That appears to be the beginning of a house. 1994, out on Wiseman Road off Westover Hills. Uh, Selma and I built that in 94. We built it from a uh, blueprint that I didn't know how to read. We used to go out there and walk through that matchsticks and uh, say, I wonder what this room is. Well, there's a lot of pipes, maybe it's a bathroom. Hey, it makes sense. Uh, so that was our dream house, and in August of uh, 1994, uh, 20 some and a half years ago, uh, they handed me the key, and the house looked like that. That's where uh, the chief picked me up this morning, 4114 Antlers Lodge. That 1985 Cadillac blew an engine, I sold it. That 1966 Mustang I still have. Yeah. Ooh, eat your heart out. It's 50, 51 years old. Uh, it's got CMS AF5 on the license plate. Who has seen my Mustang? Yeah. The guard at the gate said, wow. I said, why are you saying wow? He said, I like the car. I said, you do? He said, wow. I said, you give me your name. I'll go home and change my will and I'll leave this car to you. He said, really? I said, no. <laughs> That's where I live, 4114 Antlers Lodge. Um, I, I, I'm somewhat of a nut. I love yard work. Uh, Chief Dave Fish, you know Dave. There's Dave here, I didn't see him. Yeah, Dave's uh, my neighbor. I've known him since Altus, Oklahoma. 
And he can tell you just about every time somebody drives by him out in the yard. I just trim bushes uh, Monday. And I love to mow the yard. And uh, so I'm famous uh, for doing yard work. It takes me away from a microphone and an audience. And I get all funky and smelly. And, and I feel good. Okay. So a, a guy uh, drives by, a neighbor. And he stops and rolls the window down. Hey, Chief, how you doing? I said, I'm doing great. Every time I come by, you're working in the yard. Yeah, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy yard work. It gives me a chance to put on a headband and gloves and sweat and stink. Yeah, I enjoy it. And he said, you know, you can pay somebody $40, $50, and they'll do that for you. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that, but I like to do it. I pay myself. I use the money for Ray Tama Track to bet on number six in the fourth <laughs> race. And uh, so I'm, I've had enough of him, right? I'm ready for him to roll up the window and go on. <laughs> but he decides he's going to analyze me. Uh, Chief, uh, I want to know. I've always wondered why. What is the incentive? What is the motive? What is the reason? He, he's got me laying on a couch. Try Why I do this yard work? And so just to get rid of him and to say something, I said a phrase for which I'm now famous uh, because my name is on the mailbox. Because my name is on the mailbox. I'm giving you a moment to let that sink in. That's powerful because my name is on the mailbox. We're talking accountability. We're talking responsibility. We're talking pride. We're talking it's mine. It's got my name on it. And I'm proud of that. That's my wife. You met her. That's Carol, <laughs> who you saw in the earlier uh, uh, photo. That's my flagpole, where I have a light so I can fly it 24 hours a day. Those are my snapdragons. Those are my pittosperm bushes. That's my home. I want you to drive by and say, nice looking yard. And the only way I can do that is to put forth the effort it takes and the mental ability to say, my name is on the mailbox. I used to work at USAA. I would go out of my way in that used building to pick up a tissue on the floor. Hey, Bob, you the new janitor? No. Why are you policing up? Because it's my building. I work here. I bring people to lunch. I don't want them to say it's a messy building. It's my building. It's ownership. It's pride. It's accountability. Desert Storm. I don't know if any of you were in during Desert Storm. My favorite story, uh, CNN here. I'm on a flight line in the war zone. As you can see, there's a lot of activity. We see planes taxiing. Let me see if I can find somebody who can explain what's going on. And a senior airman walks by. Excuse me, airman, uh, CNN, please come over. Uh, uh, your name, please. Where are you from? <laughs> Kids of Buffalo, New York. And your job would be what? I'm the crew chief on that F-16 taxiing in. Oh, really, CNN? Uh, uh, where's that airplane been? I can't tell you that, sir. That's sensitive data. I surely understand that. Let me ask you this, young man. Is that a good airplane? It's the best airplane in the entire inventory. Really? What makes it so good? I thought he would say it flies fast, it'll fly far. You remember what he said? my airplane. It's my airplane. If that doesn't light your fire, your logs are wet. <laughs> <clears throat> I get goosebumps when I tell the story. It's my airplane. Common sense. <clears throat> if we want somebody to be motivated and tuned in, they uh, accept responsibility for their part. We haven't always done the best job of that. It should start with basic training. Here's the mailbox. There's room for your name. As of now, you're part owner. Yeah, we don't want to say dumb thing like, hang around a couple of years and we'll let you feel important. 
They deserve to feel important immediately and know what contribution they're making and what they're doing. Name on the mailbox. General Lester Lyles, a retired uh, AFMC, Paul Linkowski is the job he had. He's now chairman of the board of USAA. Great guy. Uh, Chief, I hope you're, you don't mind I'm using your mailbox story. Uh, sir, you pay a major $85,000 to write your damn talks. Get your own story. <laughs> Chief, it's such a great story. I was hoping you wouldn't mind. Sir, I have a feeling you're going to use the story whether I tell you you can or can't. You're probably right, he said. So I go to Maxwell and I tell my story. And they said, you stole that from General Lyle. <laughs> no, he stole it from me. Yeah. <laughs> so next time you use that, uh, yeah, I'm the guy that uh, put the name on the mailbox. Yeah, a long time ago when Snapdragons were growing. You can read that, uh, give me a chance to clear my throat. <clears> throat. That's a true statement, by the way. Yeah, yeah, you would do well when you get a new employee, be the officer, airman, civilian, to talk with them about uh, putting their name on the mailbox. You ever seen a person roll their window down, throw out a Wendy's bag of trash? When I see that, I want to stop them and say, you just threw trash. And what would they say? I don't know. They'd probably say, so what's the big deal? Well, you live here. You work here. You play here. Doesn't that bother you? And the idiot would probably say, no, no big deal. You know, I love trashy highways. Huh? Okay, go for it. But part of the problem that we've had over the years is not allowing people and encouraging people to put their name on the mailbox. Midterm exam. You're good people. Back up. Now, do all. Midterm exam. There's a couple of statements. The question simply is which is most accurate. That's all you have to decide. Uh, happy workers are productive. How do, what do you think about that? Productive workers are happy. No. All you have to do is pick. You say, I like them both. Well, I'll go back to the question. Yeah, and say, do you like them both? It says, which is the most accurate? I'm forcing you to pick. So some of you pick the top one. Oh, chief, happy workers are productive. Okay, let's uh, address that. What do you plan to do to make them happy? The ungrateful wretches. What do you plan to do <laughs> that will make them come to work happy? And what do you plan to do if they don't want to be happy? What if they say, I'm not a happy person, I don't want to be. Now what do you plan to do? Discard them and say, okay, just go over there and be quiet. No, oh, come on. Are happy workers productive? Yeah, to some degree. What makes them happy? No, I don't know. Uh, most of us think that uh, people are happy uh, because they, um, you know, have a great environment. So take a look. You say, well, this is what makes people happy. A pleasant work, good lighting, air conditioning, heating, well, yeah. skilled supervision, okay. pay, yeah, people aren't going to work without pay. Benefits and bonuses and wellness centers and grievance avenues and job security. Uh, these are what we have used over the years to try to make people happy. And then we can't understand why they're not highly motivated. Not everyone is when they come to work and they say, well, my God, I just bought some new barbells at the fitness center and they say, I don't use it. You got a daycare center. Yeah, but it doesn't open until 7.30 and my kid has to be there at 7. Yeah, these are gripies. When you and I bitch, this is what we gripe about. <laughs> yeah, we gripe, these are gripies. Some of you have griped today. Some of you said, I don't like, or why don't they? Yeah, what are they doing with BAH? Yeah, the buy rates aren't fair. Oh yeah, these are gripies. Now I have some questions before we go to the next slide. Uh, are these important? Say yes. <clears throat> well, sure they are. They are very important. What is your and my obligation? Make them as good as we can. Next question. Would you agree that these differ at every base? 
Is Isles on Alaska different from Kabul? Is Tyndall, Florida uh, different than Maelstrom, Montana? Well, sure. Everywhere you go, you get whatever's available. Are these important? Sure. What is our obligation? Do what we can. Next question, what can you do about it? Can you do anything about pay? You can give your worker some of yours. <laughs> and then they'll ask, what have you done for me lately? Are these important? Absolutely. Here's the key question. If you don't get it right, we have to go back and start over. Are these motivational when it comes to work? And the answer is no. They just, they don't make people happy. They keep them from being unhappy. And there's a big difference. I don't know when we'll learn. I think we're getting smarter. I think we're learning that these are important. We have to provide for them. But if we think that every airman is going to work, going to come to work charged up, it's just not going to happen. We have degrees of motivation. So I think you now know of the two statements that I believe the most accurate is productive employees are happy. There is no substitute whatsoever for achievement. I would ask you simply, what am I doing here? I don't get paid for this. They gave me lunch and then wouldn't let me eat it. There were people there to talk. <laughs> They gave me a shirt. I've got a whole bunch of shirts at home. They gave me a coin. I have close to 3,000. What the hell am I doing here? I don't mind telling you. I want to be a part of what you do. My God, I want to walk in my front door and my lady Margaret say, <coughs> how'd it go? And I'll say, it went great. I feel great. I poop, but I feel great. I spent a day with some great people. And they challenged me to give it my best effort. And I knocked myself out, which I'm doing right now. There is no substitute for feelings that come from achievement. Somewhere I've got a list of feelings. There they are. Look at these. Name on the mailbox. Feeling of pride in what we do. Membership on a team. I'm a part of a team. Look at pro sports, you can see that. That's why my Cubs won last year, because the manager got them together as a team. No one more important than the other. Bryant and Rizzo and Baez and Ross and those great players. They came together as a Cub team. And when they were tied with Cleveland 6-6 and the rain came and they met in the locker room and said, we've had a great year, we're not going to let it get away now. And they didn't talk about how much salary do you draw. They talked about pride and achievement and winning the game. And they went out and they beat Cleveland 8-7. A future of growth and reliable feedback. Fair and honest appraisal. Instead of giving everybody a five, give people what they earn. And sincere recognition. Well, you can read as good as I can. I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I learned this years ago, and I've spread this message since 1967. It's what people do and the feelings they get. The other things just fall in place. I've been to Kunsan, Korea in 1956. I lived in a Quonset hut. We had to go outside to use the latrine. We had to go next door. And, and the commodes were six holes in a bench. And when you flushed the commode, it cut off the hot water in the shower room. And somebody that was, uh, or took the cold water, and you would scald somebody. We've corrected that, and people still complain about Kunsan. I said, my God, you can now flush the commode when somebody's showering. And they look at you like you're crazy. So you can do all you want about environmental factors. It's the feelings that people get. Enough of that. I don't want to beat that to death if I haven't already. Everybody, it seems to me, everybody has a motto. Uh, Delta is ready when you are. We're American Airlines doing what we do best. Fly the friendly skies of United. Have it your way at Burger King. 
We know what it means to serve USA Insurance. I assume you have a motto. I assume you have a motto. I would hope everybody should have a motto. Don't you have a motto? Fly, fight, win. Ooh, wow. Fly, fight, win. Go get them, baby. Yeah, everybody has to have a motto. How could you get by without a motto? He's like, I don't have a motto. You will when I finish, because I have a motto. I went to Laredo to give a talk down on the border. I got there five hours early. My stomach told me I was hungry. A hamburger street, uh, a hamburger shack on the street. Not a restaurant, a shack, leaning. Parking space, guy behind the counter, little grill, French fry dipper. Can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm killing time. Uh, I'll have one of your hamburgers. What do you want on it? Everything. You want a soda? You have orange? He digs through the ice chest. He didn't even have a cooler. He had a propane tank and an ice chest. He digs out my orange soda. I watch him fix my burger. I wonder how many burgers he's ever fixed. He served me, I paid him. I got my burger and my soda, now what do I do? It was too hot sitting in the car. Stand here under his canvas awning and eat your burger. I witnessed the most amazing event. His phone rang. He's going high tech. And he begins to write and I watch him as he writes and my mind said he appears to be taking an order. And uh, he hangs up and he puts six patties on the grill. That's all it would hold. And he put french fries in a dipper. And then his hands begin to do this. Mayonnaise, lettuce, cheese, turn the burgers, shake the fries. Wow. A couple of times I wanted to applaud. This guy was good. I thought I was in a bullfight. I wanted to say, ole, ole. <laughs> andale, andale. I don't know what those mean, but it seemed like something to yell. He was good. He got a big sack and filled the sack with uh, filled the sack with the food, and he turned across from me and he barked a name, and I went, <laughs> "I'm the only one here." A moment of confusion. The guy's yelling a name, and I'm wondering who's he yelling at. And out from man the shack came a small boy. Best I can figure, he was sitting in the shade of the shack. The guy hands him the bag and gives him instructions in Spanish, and the kid took off running. I have to emphasize running. Who's the Jamaican? Hussein Bolt, is that a name? Yeah, this guy would have passed Bolt. This kid, I'm talking, he was churning. And I went, look at him go. Something lit his afterburn. And I finished my burger killing time and I turned to leave and here he came running. And he came up and he put on the brakes. And he's going <sighs> And I decided to interview, to interview this kid. I was killing time. Here's the interview. Hi, how's that for an opening coming? He went, hi, what is your name? He said, Juan. How old are you, Juan? He said, 11. Eleven? He said, eleven. You work here every afternoon after school, 3.30 to 5.30. And your job would be what, Juan? I'm delivery service. I sort of figured that. Where'd you take that order? A drugstore on Salinas Avenue. You're really running, he said. I always do. Isn't that a great line? I always do. Every order? Yes, sir. Over and back? Yes, sir. That fast? Yes, sir. Why? Isn't that a great question? Why? An 11-year-old boy cocked his head and said, people like hot french fries. That's what he said. People like hot french fries. I said, you're probably right. <laughs> I got in my car and left. I gave my talk. I headed back on I-35, 150 miles. Who's driven Laredo to San Antonio? It's lonely. Catula's the first town, 68 miles. 
It's you and cactus. <laughs> so I'm reflecting, how'd the day go? How'd the speech go? How did the ladies? It was uh, women's banking. And so how did my talk go over? And then it hit me, right between the eyes. Juan has found the answer. People like hot french fries. I want to turn around and go back and get his name. I want him to marry my granddaughter. <laughs> Someday he'll have his own jet airplane with hot fries on the side. He'll be flying to his restaurants in Orlando and Toronto and San Diego because he knows one thing and that is what? People like hot french fries. Now I have two questions for you. One easy, one more difficult. Is that true? Seems to be. Number two, answer to yourself only. Do you deliver hot fries? I do. I knock myself out. Just the way I act. Many of you have heard me talk. This is Bob Gaylor. Right now, I got a, two drops of sweat racing down my back. This one's winning. I don't mow my yard, I manicure it. I don't eat an apple, I devour the damn thing. <laughs> Whatever I do, I do with passion. I'm not talking about heavy breathing in a bedroom. I'm talking about a desire to do the best I can. My name is on the mailbox. I deliver out fries. By the way, that's a TED Talk. You can see it on YouTube. It's an 18 minute, I did a TED Talk. It's had 17 million hits. I got an email from a teacher in uh, Bangor, Maine. I just want you to know, Mr. Gaylor, I show your TED Talk to all my students every class. That made me feel good. And it made me think of Juan, an 11-year-old boy, a young lad of great wisdom. People like hot french fries. I can't imagine people going to work and delivering cold fries why would you take time to do that? It just seemed to me you put your name on the mailbox and you deliver hot fries. That's my talk. That's my talk. I think that's the end of it. I think I'm out of slides. That's where we started with that. Uh, now it won't come back. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That's where we started with my coin. It's common sense, isn't it? I haven't said anything profound. Some of you say it might even be saying I'm a little disappointed. Is that the best he got? Yeah. You take those two, you got your money's worth. Put your name on the mailbox and deliver out fries. I don't know what else you want. In this age of technology, where now we're so wrapped up in how many Facebook friends we have, many of whom you've never met, and some of them that are completely weird, and if you ever did meet them, you wouldn't like them, you may want to take a step back and say, uh, what is going on in my life? Yeah, right now we got road rage and we got uh, education problems in our schools and we have sexual harassment in the military and throughout our, what the hell's going on? You can have all, we're not everybody's not got their name on the mailbox and they're not delivering hot fries. Those are a couple of good mottos that we can keep with us. General Spacey and Chief Lugo, my gosh, and Cerny, uh, y'all are great, really. What a day, I'll not forget this, uh, really. When uh, my, I guarantee you my two daughter and son will call now, how to go, Dad? Uh, how to go, Dad? And I'll say, my gosh, from my eyes, it went great. Y'all are great people. Yeah, some of you have heard the story. Uh, I went home on leave to Indiana in 1951. Uh, single, had a car, hot stuff, 21 years old. Met a young lady going into her senior year of high school. Invited her to a movie. Her dad let her go. She became my girlfriend. She wrote me letters at Waco, Texas, sent me her senior class picture. Who's that, Bob? That's my girlfriend. Yeah, she's cute, I think so. Uh, eight months later, she wrote me a letter. Dear Bob, I met a young man I like better than you. She wrote me a Dear Bob letter. 
I wrote back and said, I understand. I met a young lady I like better than you. <laughs> so she married her man, I married my lady, and we went separate ways. She and Bob were married 59 years. Selma and I were married 59 years. She had four kids, two boys, two girls. Selma and I had four kids, two boys, two girls. Bob died in 2010. Selma died in 2012. You see where I'm going with this. <laughs> High school reunions. Mulberry, Indiana. I was the speaker. I asked one of my classmates, is Margaret here? That's her over in the corner. What happened? <laughs> Ooh. My mind said, she's still cute. <laughs> Hi, Margaret, how are you? I'm fine. Sorry to hear about you losing your husband. Sorry to hear about it. Well, it's nice to see you. Uh, how many kids do you have? Four? Well, so did I. Well, who knows? If I come back to Mulberry, I'll you know, give you a call. Bye, Margaret. 2013, I went back and uh, I invited her to Olive Garden for lunch. Two days later, a Cracker Barrel for breakfast. <laughs> we just hit it off. She's so sweet and we just, we had so much in common. We talked about Mulberry. She went to school with my brother, John, a graduate, same class. Class 47, she was class of 52. Uh, she's at my home now. Some of you may have met her. She's a sweet lady. Um, yeah, she's, uh, uh, we go to Mulberry every once in a while. She, her son lives next door and watches over her property. She's my lady. I told one audience she frosts my cake. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but my cake is frosted. I, 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 uh, I tell you the story for a couple reasons and then I'll let you go. Uh, I thought when I was young that I only had so much love and so I had to ration it so I wouldn't run out. You got more love than you can ever give away. So uh, tell your kids and your spouse how much you love them and your mom and your dad. and Let your friends know how important they are in your life. Don't ration it. I'm more generous now. I've given out my affection. Number two, uh, people have a right to be happy. People have a right to be happy, and there are a lot of people in America who are not happy. Margaret and I are happy. We make each other happy. We enjoy uh, watching Jeopardy and the Spurs play. She's now a Cub fan, not by choice, but by, uh, <laughs> has to be. Yeah, she wouldn't be able to live in my house if she wasn't a Cub. <laughs> people have a right to be happy. One lady, her husband died, she put on his tombstone, my light has gone out. Three years later, she met a man she wanted to be with and she said to the preacher, what should I put on the tombstone? He said, just put, I struck another match. That's what Margaret and I have done, I struck another match. So I'll tell her about you. Yeah, she was invited to come today, but it's a bit too long of a day uh, for her. Uh, yesterday she had an x-ray on her hip. She's got a little bit of arthritis like old people get. But she's a sweetheart. Does this mean we didn't love our spouses? Absolutely not. It doesn't mean that at all. We both had great lives. But there's no reason why we have to sulk into obscurity when something tragic happens. Nor do we have to go out and find another mate. We just have to invest ourselves in life the passion of life, the opportunities of life, whatever they might be, whatever they might be, digging around the rose bed, going to a baseball game, but seeking happiness instead of just sitting back and waiting for the uh, big sickle to come and take you. Thank you, sir, for inviting me. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for all that you do and for being great people. Thank you. So I think I just got a coin. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Chief. Uh, you said that we made that you that we made your day. You made ours. Uh, who, and, and then we just want to present. I know you have a lot of coins, but this coin here 
is your favorite coin. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. My, so, and you know they're getting prettier and prettier. My God, that's fancy. So this is our shield, of course, and you see the warfighter hand delivering capabilities everywhere in the world. And hot fries, I can see. Uh, yes, there. there's hot fries in there too. And hot fries, day or night. And of course, uh, this is presented on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. May the good Lord uh, travel with you safely. Thank you.